Welcome, welcome, welcome back in. It's the second edition now of Fast Break with Asa. I am Jay Burr. I am not Asa, but I've got the boss here with me uh, this week. Um, I'm excited for this one. Now, you guys know from the last episode, I'm kind of a chatty dude here. I, I like to talk a lot, but but I'm actually going to sort of take a back seat here this week. Um, I know a lot of folks probably know this guy that uh, we've got this week, head coach for the Arkansas Razorbacks, the basketball team. Head coach Eric Musselman joins us uh, this go-around. And before I kind of get out of the way, Coach, how you doing? Uh, how, how's it been here recently? I know you you are probably as busy as anybody out there. I'm doing great. You know, we're, uh, we've, we've had a, a kind of a two-week down period. Uh, all the players are getting ready to come back on campus. We're about to start our eight out of ten weeks training session, and we're all looking forward to it, and I appreciate it. Uh, Governor Hutchinson having me on today. Well, with that, uh, Coach, let me uh, jump in there. And first of all, uh, I want to tell you that I'm wearing cufflinks today, but they're basketball cufflinks uh, in your honor. And uh, I I love what you're doing with the Razorbacks. But, you know, this podcast, uh, you know, we want to talk uh, about life through the lens of basketball. And I think uh, you've seen it in every respect. And uh, let me start, though, with your family. I, I uh, had a great occasion with you and Danielle coming down to uh, the mansion and having dinner with Susan and me and a few other coaches and uh, talking about life and getting to know you a little bit better. And then, you know, Danielle's your, the biggest fan. And then I love the fact that your dad uh, was a coach. You've got uh, a son involved. Uh, you've got, uh, I believe it's your mom, Chris that critiques you. And so your family is very, very engaged, it seems to me. So talk a little bit about that. And why is that important to you? Well, I think, um, you know, for, for so many different reasons, first of all, yes, my father, uh, you know, was a coach. He coached at the University of Minnesota. He was also the first coach of the uh, NBA Minnesota Timberwolves. He coached the Cleveland Cavaliers when I was in high school, 10th grade. Uh, through 12th grade. So I was, I was a ball boy at a really, really young age. Um, not many people get to work in NBA locker room, which I was able to. Um, my dad was my best friend. He was my idol. I always wanted to walk in his footsteps. I knew from a very young age that I probably was not going to be able to play at a high level based on the size and lack of athleticism to, to some degree. Um, and I wanted to be a coach. So I studied my dad um, would watch film with them. My mom would drop me off at the University of Minnesota at three o'clock after school. And I'd sometimes get back at 1030 at night after practice. And he reviewed practice game tape. I would go on road trips with him. And then, um, you know, with my family now, obviously my wife, she's our, actually our greatest recruiter. She does a phenomenal job when we have players on visits. And then once players uh, end up committing to the University of Arkansas, she does a great job of of kind of getting to know our players off the floor. Uh, um, she likes to mentor our guys from a media standpoint because her background is is in the media field where she worked for NFL Network, ESPN, and Fox Sports. Um, and then my son being on staff, Michael's on staff. He was with me at Nevada. Um, he, he's actually increased his role here um, to, to now be director of basketball operations. He's done a ton of the recruiting for us, organizing us from the recruiting standpoint. And then I have a younger son, Matthew, at the University of San Diego is a junior there. He also would like to get into the coaching profession. And then we have a daughter, Mariah, um, who lives with, uh, with, lives with us here in Fayetteville. And she's very involved in her dance, what she thinks is going to be a dance career. So that's kind of a quick synopsis of, our, of my family situation. And why is that important to you that uh, they're involved? Well, I think, you know, unlike a lot of professions, uh, the coaching profession is, you know, it's 12 months, it's uh, seven days a week. Um, You know, even in the off season, you know, for instance, a day like Sunday, um, you know, I'm watching the NBA playoff game that takes two and a half hours of my time because I'm trying to study what's going on currently in the NBA playoffs. And obviously, Danielle loves to watch, but Mariah might not want to watch a game. And then I, uh, talking to players, recruits, uh, on FaceTime. And so your, your time away from your family, it's so time consuming. And so 
you, you need a family that's really supportive and a family that's extremely involved. My wife will come to practices periodically. My daughter will come to practices. I, I like to try to involve them and, and our assistant coaches family on road trips. Um, you know, you've got to, when, when you're doing an NCAA tournament run, yes, you want to be as focused as possible, but uh, your families need to enjoy that experience as well. So we try to get as many families and kids uh, of our coaches and, and support staff members on, on flights well, because uh, this is a job that's really, really unique. Well, and that's uh, the larger point is that uh, basketball coaching is an all-consuming profession. You've got to devote everything to it. I make the comparison to politics. Uh, in politics, it's all-consuming in a, in a same way, and there's some risk involved in that to the family. And so uh, I've always included my family on my campaigns and engaged in that. And sometimes they like it, sometimes they don't, but that's the only way to stay together. And it's really been important for me uh, the support of the family and the political arena as well. And I think that's, uh, that's what you see uh, in basketball. Now, let me uh, come back, though, and I love your career. If you look at your bio, I mean, obviously, you've taken Arkansas to the Elite Eight two years in a row. Incredible. Before that, you were a winning coach at Nevada. You had incredible records in the NBA. And so it just looks like uh, your steps in basketball coaching has been paved with gold. There's never been a challenge. It's always been uh, a winning season for you. But I want you to talk about for a second uh, any setbacks that you've had and, and uh, if you've had any tough times or tough years where you looked at it and wondered whether you're going to be able to, to be successful or not. Can you talk a little bit about how you've overcome any setbacks? Well, yeah, there's a, there's been a lot for sure, Governor Hutchinson. I think that, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, you know, having coached the Golden State Warriors. My first year there, I was runner up to Greg Popovich for NBA Coach of the Year. And then we uh, had a management change after the second year, um, you know, where Gary St. Jean was, was the original general manager that hired me. Chris Mullen took over. Um, that's the first time that I'd ever been fired. Um, from a job and and in the NBA that happens when there's management changes and um, you know I I was fortunate enough to to jump on real quickly with with the Memphis Grizzlies and 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 work for Mike Fratello spent a year and a half there and then got an opportunity with Sacramento and was with the Kings for just one year um, and got fired after after one year in Sacramento and and at that juncture you know I I really had to evaluate you know, where was my coaching career going? I took three years off in the prime of my career, literally the, the, the most prime years for a coach. I, I did not coach. I wanted to reconnect with my two sons. I had gone through a divorce. Um, and so my time was coaching AAU basketball, uh, being an assistant coach on little league teams um, for both my sons. Um, and then went back to the G league and the G league is a heart, you know, that's a very humbling experience. If you're going from NBA head coach to then your next job, uh, coaching in the G league, a lot of long bus rides, um, you know, coaching in front of really no crowds whatsoever. I um, mean, you have to do it for the love of the game and you've got to do it for, for the long view of where this could take you. I did that for two years. Um, and then, probably the most humbling experience ever. I, I wanted to get involved in college coaching, but I knew that I did not know the college landscape. I didn't know how to recruit. I didn't know how to put together college scheduling. Um, so I went to Arizona State for two years under Herb Sendak, was his assistant coach, and then one year uh, at LSU under Johnny Jones. And uh, so I spent three years just sitting back, trying to learn the college landscape, and then got an opportunity at Nevada um, but I think when you've been, uh, released, fired from a job, you have incredible respect for the profession and it puts everything in a different light. And, um, I feel fortunate that I went through those experiences of, of Golden State and Sacramento. Uh, it made me a better coach. Uh, it made me take a, a longer viewpoint on everything. Um, and I got to reflect on things I did well, things I could improve on. 
Um, and again, I, you know, I, I look at the success, the four years at Nevada, the three years now um, at Arkansas and, and those seven years of successful coaching um, probably don't happen at the rate they do without me learning uh, some things about myself, learning some things about the coaching profession um, through the experience of being let go. Well, thanks for sharing that. And in the political world, I always say that uh, the voters have to humble you before they'll ever elect you. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, the first time I ran for governor, I lost. Uh, and it's it's challenging world out there. And I look at uh, the colleagues that I served with in Congress, and uh, they generally had losses in their background. And uh, I think it's important for people to understand that uh, success really is the result of overcoming obstacles and being persistent and having faith in yourself. And, uh, and I really appreciate uh, the priority that you put on your family as well, Coach. No, I appreciate that. And it's so true that, you know, everybody throughout their career, like, especially in the coaching profession, if you haven't been fired, you will be fired. That's just kind of the nature of it. And, and the great thing for me is having, having watched my dad uh, go through some of that. I remember um, driving to school and having the radio on. And that's, that's how I found out my dad was fired from the wow. Cleveland Cavaliers, which is, you know, you got to pull the car over. You got to, you know, tears are coming down, you know, your face. And, and uh, so you learn really quickly kind of what, what this profession is really all about. All right, so we got to uh, talk about last season, which wound up uh, Elite Eight, another incredible season for you. But there was a time that uh, it didn't look uh, too bright at the beginning of the SEC. And I just uh, looked at the schedule, and uh, you lost to Oklahoma, you lost to Hofstra, uh, you beat uh, Elon, and then you lost to Mississippi State, uh, Vanderbilt, and Texas A&M, all three losses going into the SEC, and uh, it looked like it was headed toward a very difficult season, and all of a sudden, the team changed. And so uh, I've heard you make some comments about it, but one, how, how worried were you at that point, and, and what did it take to change things, and what was this key to turning it around? I know how difficult it is when you have a lost momentum to turn things around. Yeah, and I, I think it, you know, it happened the year before in that elite eight run as well. We had lost it at LSU um, pretty bad. And then we, we came back and, and we had a practice that I was willing to sacrifice maybe the game at Alabama because we, we went into Tuscaloosa with no legs because of the physicality of the practice that we had after the LSU lost. And we, and we really got beat bad uh, at Alabama. So the year before we went through, not quite the same struggles that we had last year, but what we talked to our team about, hey, we're not right right now. Like our team, our locker room, we're not, we're not in the right spot. Um, and then we made a change in the starting lineup. We went with a bigger, more physical team, a better defensive team, um, and that really changed the complexion. Sometimes um, a role player like Trey Wade can change the whole makeup of your team. Uh, we were better offensively, better defensively, just because there was more flow, uh, and there was a lot of sacrifice. Trey Wade was was a guy that was would sacrifice individual stats for the betterment of the team. Um, but but the main focus in reality was how do we get better every day? How do we put in perspective that we are as good as any team from a talent standpoint? Now we've got to have chemistry to go along with the talent. And we talked about that on a daily basis. We had players get up and speak. We had uh, a lot of individual meetings with guys as well. But it was really just, you know, hey, we can still make a, a, a big, strong NCAA tournament run. But we've got to understand right now we're not even in the tournament. We got a long way to go. Um, we had to understand not to read what was on social media and to not lose focus, to not become splintered. Uh, and really, uh, uh, the last two years, a lot of it has to do with, with recruiting guys that have great mental toughness as well to be able to overcome a situation where both years uh, the season could have 
you know, kind of spun in, in, in the opposite direction from what it ended up being. Wow. The mental toughness is a critical, critical part of it. I can't imagine you being successful about keeping people off social media and not reading it. If if you can figure that out, let me know, because <laughs> we need to stay off of that. Uh, it can be discouraging sometimes. All right, but that leads me uh, to leadership, and uh, you and the team uh, exercise a lot of leadership, figuring out where the problem was and turning things around. In my life, I've been blessed to see a lot of great leaders in the uh, business and the political world. I think about Sam Walton, and you could describe his leadership of management by walking around, uh, going back to Abraham Lincoln's days. Uh, you know, I look at uh, uh, the encouragement that I received from Secretary Ridge. He was an encourager, and he led by encouragement. And then I see other leaders like uh, Newt Gingrich, who had more of, I'm the general, I'm in charge, this is what we got to do, approach to it. So how do you describe your leadership style uh, in basketball, and not just in basketball, but in life and as a leader? Well, I think a lot of those, you, you know, to me, with the basketball team, you've got to wear all those hats at different times during the course of the season. I think, you know, sometimes during the season, um, you know, you, you've got to be an encourager and you've got to try to pick guys up that might be in a shooting slump. And, and then there's other times maybe that someone needs uh, some motivation because maybe they're not playing as hard as they possibly could. Um, sometimes the bench um, or your minutes can, can be a great leadership tool. Um, you know, sometimes you don't have to say anything. It's, it's, you know, come have a seat next to, next to us. And, and, and that'll help motivate and turn a guy around. But I think from a leadership standpoint, uh, I think with all of us, sometimes our greatest strengths are also our greatest weaknesses. Um, I know with me, um, I'm overly competitive. Um, and, but I also feel like our team takes on that personality of, of always being competitive, never believing you're out of, out of a game, playing for 40 minutes, playing an entire 30 game season. Um, so I think that that relentless approach, um, I hope that, that our players see that through our coaching staff and then they take on that same type of personality. So every player responds to things differently. And uh, I know I have a grandson, you know, that played basketball in a Division II school, and he didn't respond very well to coaches yelling at him. Uh, and, and you've got others that maybe they need a more forceful coach and you, others that need encouragement. How do you identify the players and what motivates them and how you manage that? Well, I think you got you really got to understand each person because everybody is uh, different. You know, some, some players are really prideful and you can't point them out, uh, individually, uh, in a, in a timeout or a huddle, or you can't point things out, uh, about a certain individual in a film session. Others can, can take that and want that. And, you know, I've learned so much from so many great leaders like Chuck Daly. Uh, he would, he would pull a player aside and tell him, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with some stuff today in film. And I want you to know beforehand, but I need you to accept the coaching so that the other guys on the team can also take constructive criticism. Um, some of the things that we talk about prior to the season are, Hey, this is what it's going to be like in our locker room after a loss. It's not going to be accepted. There's going to be a lot of truth serum that's going to come out after a game. And so you kind of prepare players for what it's like after a loss, what it could be like after a win, uh, what it's like mid season and how practice, uh, physicality is going to be, or ch how it changes, um, how practice early in the season is, is maybe going to be a little bit longer than practice in December. Um, but I think the main thing from a coaching standpoint with players is, um, just as any walk of life, you've got to have open communication uh, you've got to talk about situations before they actually happen. I think too many leaders, um, as it's happening in real time, it's the first time that that players are experiencing that. And I think that's when you run into some difficult situations. But it's always about understanding each player individually, 
And then what makes that player tick or what, how can you get the most out of that person? Everybody's got different motivational techniques. Some it's through film, sending it individually. Others it's team film. Um, so I think it's really just trying to figure out uh, an individual person and what their vision is for them individually. And then how do they see themselves with the collective unit? What I, what I hear there that's very important to me is how you prepare your student athletes for what's ahead and what they can expect. And I think back through uh, the pandemic that we've all experienced in America and as a leader, you know, I had to be transparent. I had to make it clear to everybody what, what's happening, what they can expect, uh, and help prepare them for uh, what they saw as the unknown. So. Uh, that is critically important in whatever leadership role that you have. All right, this is a fast break. I got a couple questions. This first question here is from uh, my security detail with the Arkansas State Police, Jeremy Page. I asked him, well, what would you ask Coach Musselman? And he said, I don't, uh, everybody asks about, you know, the next year, what's Razorback basketball going to be like next year? Forget next year. I want to look five years ahead. Uh, what is Razorback basco- basketball going to be like five years from now? Well, I hope we can grow the program every year. I mean, I feel like uh, from year one to year two, we grew as a program. From year two to year three, we've grown as a program. And now as we look into next year, you know, the recruiting uh, at the high school level has has gone to a, a whole new level and maybe a level that it hasn't been at Um you know, prior and then uh, bringing in quality transfers and uh, now sold out buildings. So as I look five years into the future, I hope that we're continuing to build and we can make this thing sustainable. I think that, you know, to have one good year, two good years, you know, how do you every single day talk about the upcoming year, but also have a, have a four or five year you know, program in mind. And we've always at Nevada, that was like like a daily conversation is how do we go from year one, year two, year three, year four, where we continue to rise. Uh, And that's what happened. Our fourth year was, was, was our best year from a regular season standpoint. And we certainly hope that, that five years from now, um, for instance, Bud Walt that sold out, how do you make that better in five years? Well, hopefully our game ops become better and and, and, and we make it more to, of, of an event and not just a basketball game. And Bud Walton is the place to be um, from a social aspect, not, not just, hey, we're going to go watch a basketball game, but we're also going to go socialize because that's where we need to be uh, in the state on that given night. So I think there's a lot of areas that five years from now we want to continue to get a lot better at than where we are currently. Well, my goal is that in five years, first of all, you're still the coach of the Arkansas Razorback basketball program. And secondly, you don't enter politics because you'd win whatever race that you ran for. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, I think we're just about out of time. Oh, we, we still got a few here, but coach, uh, a couple things I wanted to throw at you is uh, I know you're, you're in a, a pretty big circle of coaches. It's, it's a tight knit group also, but you know, kind of in your walks of life, I know you interact with coaches, you, you have the big conferences and, and things like that, but who, who would make a good politician in, in that circle of coaches? I mean, everybody kind of thinks of, you know, the Calipari's of the world, you know, with the slick hair and, and, and good in front of a mic, but, but who would be a good politician, a good, you know, executive type? Well, it's interesting because we are getting ready to have some SEC meetings coming up in Destin. Uh, I would love to be in the football meeting, to be honest with you. Um, what's happened <laughs> over the last couple of weeks? I think, I mean, that's pretty fascinating when you think about the football coaches in our league and, and in the SEC, and then and then the same thing with the basketball um, coaches. But I would, I do, I if I, if I had to name a basketball coach, I would go with Coach Calipari. Um, I've known Coach Cal the longest out of all the coaches. Actually, when I was an assistant coach. Uh, with the Grizzlies, Coach Calipari uh, was coaching Memphis Tigers, and uh, Coach Fratello was really good friends with uh, Coach Calipari. And uh, I have great respect for what he's done because he wins year after year after year. He's done it in a lot of different places. 
He's done it a lot of different styles of play. Um, and I do think he's great in front of the microphone. I like to watch his press conferences. I think he'd be a great politician. You know, that's interesting that you said that. I actually got to uh, sit with uh, Coach Calipari at a uh, basketball game in Cabot whenever he was recruiting Malik Monk. And uh, guess what? He wanted to talk politics with me. Uh, and so that you, you nailed it there. But I, I learned something later. I always liked Calipari. And so I said something positive about him. Social media blew up as if you can't say anything positive about anybody from Kentucky. <laughs> no, I, 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 I love Coach Calipari. I'll tell you guys the one thing that's really interesting to me is if you watch Coach Cal's press conferences, either pregame or postgame, he always compliments the other coach. And for him to do that, I mean, he's doing it for a reason. And if you watch him talk about coaches that might um, be in a year where, you know, they need some help publicly, he does an incredible job of, of pumping up uh, the coaching profession, probably better than anyone in any sport that I've ever seen of understanding how hard the job is and how we all need to support one another. Wow. That's a, that's a terrific commentary on uh, leadership as well. Uh, we're under encouraged in life. We need to encourage each other, whether it's in the uh, coaching profession or uh, even in the uh, political arena, we need to uh, have more civility and respect for each other. I think that would speak well for our country. Well, Coach, thanks for being with us today. This has really been terrific, uh, fast break, and uh, hope we can do this again sometime. I would love to. Before we get off, though, um, Governor Hutchinson, I would like to give, if, if it's okay, a scouting report yes. um, on your pickup game. <laughs> um, I... I I, I have received video footage, um, and so I wrote down some notes as if it was a scouting report. Active in the mid post, good facilitator, excellent cutter, good screen setter, can knock down the 15-foot elbow area jump shot. Defensively, great verticality around the rim to alter shots. So there's my scouting report on Governor Hutchinson's pickup basketball game. It sounds, wow. like, it sounds like a guy uh, you, you might need for the next maybe five years uh, on your squad, doesn't it? I, I, <laughs> I don't know about our squad. But... <laughs> oh, no. Jay, w w way to open that one up. You know, you sort of set that one up too bad. Oh, man. <laughs> well, He's got some eligibility. You know, and – and, and the other thing you left out is I can't do three-point shots very well, so you don't, you don't need me. I'm an inside well, I guy. Only, I only talked about the positives, Governor Hutchinson. I you did, did not get into any. It was all a positive scouting report. All right. Uh, you're, I, I'm going to need you to do a scouting report on my political uh, uh, attributes as well sometimes, so keep that in mind down the road. Hey, thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> <laughs>